Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. First of all, I want to congratulate the organizers, the volunteers for putting together such a fantastic event, for bringing people together for such a noble cause, a cause that often does not get the attention that it deserves. And what I see as success from events like this is not just the amount of money collected, but the paradigm shift. A shift in our thinking, a shift in our priorities, an embodiment of the Prophet Wasallam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Ibghuni fi du'afa. If you are seeking me, then seek me amongst the oppressed. Hal turzaquna wa tunsaruna illa bi du'afaikum. Are you supported or given victory or the aid of God except by how you treat your most vulnerable. Find me amongst the oppressed. Find me amongst the weak. Find me amongst the vulnerable. You will not find the Prophet ﷺ in the courtyards of the kings or the courtyards of the powerful except to call them to be more responsible and accountable to that power and the one who actually bestowed that power upon them. But if you seek him, you will find him amongst the most vulnerable of a society. And I pray that Allah allow this to be a moment that springboards the Muslim community here in Canada to act for the indigenous in this country. Not just to spend on them, to advocate for them, to be their voice and to uplift them. Before I even start talking about Muhammad Ali, um, I want to talk about Reverend Michael Waters and what he has meant to me and what he's meant to the Muslim community. And I want to just put you in this scene. When you flee bullets together, something happens to you. <laughs> I don't know how many of you actually caught that experience. But I can tell you what solidarity looks like in those unspoken moments. Solidarity when after a rally, which I don't remember if it was after a mass shooting or a Palestine rally or something like that in Thanksgiving Square, when the Muslim community went to do its salah, when it went to do its prayer, and it was 8.30 and people had left and we had to do our Maghrib prayer. And while we were praying, because it was dark, we didn't have lights, I noticed a shadow. And when I finished praying, without me even asking him to do so, he was standing behind us facing, making sure that no one would disturb us or hurt us in our prayer. I didn't ask him to do that. It became natural. It's not just a part of our brotherhood or our solidarity. It's not just a part of becoming a family. It's actually the instinctive mercy and sense of justice that God has put in each and every single one of us. And so I transition into Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali meant a lot to the Muslims, but he didn't mean a lot only to Muslims. Muhammad Ali meant a lot to black people in America, but he didn't only mean something to black people in America. Muhammad Ali meant a lot to the Viet Cong, who had been dehumanized, because America never sees the people on the other side of the barrel. Even when we speak about anti-war policy, typically we speak about it from the perspective of wasted resources or even sending people off to war that are not afforded the same liberties at home. But we rarely see the people on the other side of the bomb, the people on the other side of the barrel. Muhammad Ali saw them and uplifted them and he meant a lot to them. Because when you become a warrior for truth, you cannot have that cognitive dissonance and only see the plight of one people as important. He learned that from his teacher, Malcolm X, Al-Hajj Malik al-Shabazz, rahimahullah, who took interest in him before he was famous. Malcolm took interest in Cassius when he was 18 years old. He wasn't famous yet. He didn't have a world championship shot. Most people were not even aware of their relationship until four years later when Malcolm showed up in Miami, Florida to sit next to him as he prepared for his fight against Sonny Liston. And Malcolm was the first African-American leader to speak about Vietnam. He spoke about the Japanese, the plight of the Japanese. If you look at the picture of Malcolm assassinated, you'll see that the woman that's holding his head up in his assassination is a Japanese activist, Yuri, who said that the only 
leader that I could find in America that would talk about our plight was Malcolm. And she clinged on to him, and he was her hope, where he spoke about the tragedy of the nuclear bombs that America had dropped. Malcolm, who went to Gaza, who went to Palestine in 1964, and penned an essay about the oppression of the Palestinians when it, when it wasn't even on the radar of people in America. Muhammad Ali learned that you could not be a warrior for one people. Because Allah described the Prophet, peace be upon him, as rahmatan lil alameen, as a mercy to the world. And if you want to embody mercy, you cannot be selective with that mercy. Because it becomes a quality that you have. And so whether you see an image of someone on TV that has the same religion as you, or someone that speaks the same language as you, or someone that has the same skin color as you, or someone who has none of those things, you embody mercy to those people. Because that's how Allah conditions mercy in a people. Now there's a saying in our tradition as we phase into Muhammad Ali, and if you wonder why Reverend Waters kept speaking about him as Cassius, because we had an agreement that he would speak about Cassius, and I would talk about Muhammad. There's a saying that we have, فَاقِدِ الشَّيْ لَا يُعْطِي The one who does not have cannot give. If you don't have peace, you can't give peace. Pastor Waters spoke about an emptiness that precedes something special. It precedes being filled with something else. So at one point, Cassius was empty, but he was filled and he became Muhammad Ali and embodied something to a lot of people. And unless you have a deep sense of your own purpose, then even when you act for people, you might act for selfish gains. Let me tell you something. Um, when I read these self-care books and, and manuals and, and watch these videos, every time you hear people talk about philanthropy now and charity, they talk about it from the perspective of making yourself feel more wholesome and better and productive. Somehow, in our era of individualism, we've even made charity greedy. Because it's about how you feel. Because you need to go out there and shout for people and spend on people so you can feel better. Just to the extent, not to the extent that you'll actually get them out of their cause or out of their hardship. To the extent that you will feel good about yourself. So you can sleep better at night and say, I gave that much money for this cause. Not to actually lift them out of that plight or for the sake of Allah, but you know, I need to feel good about myself. It's the opposite. You need to be deeply in tune with your purpose. Because I'm speaking after the fundraiser, I'm going to teach. And we have a selection of slides and videos and clips of the great Muhammad Ali, and I'm going to start with the first one. During the next 16 years, what's the best thing I can do? Get ready to meet God. Owning real estate, going in business, teaching boxers, that won't get me to heaven. God is watching me. God is God don't praise me because I be Joe Frazier. God don't care nothing about England or America as far as we are wealth is all he is. He wants to know how do we treat each other, how do we help each other. So I'm gonna dedicate my life to using my name and popularity, helping charities, helping people, uniting people, bring people bumming each other because of religious beliefs. We need somebody in the world to help us make peace. So when I die, if there's a heaven, I want to see it. Because we live how long? 80 years? The odds are everybody in this room, some of you are going to be dead 20 years from now. Some of you are going to be dead 50 years from now. Some are going to be dead 30. And some are going to be dead 60, 70 years from now. We all going to die soon. So this is a test to see where will we spend our life in heaven or hell. This is not the life now. Your real self is inside you. Your body gets old. Some of you go to look at the fridge, look old. you don't have no teeth. Your hair is leaving you. Your bodies get tired. But your soul and your spirit never die. That's gonna live forever. So your body is just housing your soul and spirit. So God is testing us on how we treat each other, how we live, to see where our real home be in heaven. So this physical stuff don't last for so long. So my car, this building is going to be here when the man who built it dead. There have been many kings and queens of England, they're all dead. After this one is gone, another one will come. So we don't stay here, we're just trustees. We don't own nothing. 
Even your children are not yours, if you think I'm lying. Your wife is not yours. You don't own your children. You don't own your family. So what am I saying? The most important thing about life is what's going to happen when you die. Are you going to go to heaven or hell? And that's eternity. How long is eternity? So what am I going to do when I'm through fighting? I only have 16 years to be productive, get myself ready to meet God and go to the best place. Don't that make sense? Thank you. This was a man, you can hold your applause for later, <laughs> but it's okay. This was a man who deeply understood himself, who deeply understood his purpose, who saw through not just the opponent that was in the ring, but more importantly, saw through the opponent that was inside of him. And the one who strives is the one who strives against himself for the sake of God. This was a man who could not be conquered by anyone or anything else because he conquered himself. Who understood that whether he was met with harm or whether he was met with ease, whether he was blessed with money or, or fame or tested with poverty, and public disgrace that the only opinion of him that mattered was the opinion of God. And the only abode that mattered was the abode of paradise that he so desperately sought. You know, in his last years, before he developed Parkinson's, he was sad. He said he wanted to practice how to do da'wah, how to talk to people, and he wanted to spend the rest of his life on the road doing that, and then he was afflicted. And there was an imam who told me that I met him just a few months before his death, and I said, everything that you could have possibly wanted to achieve with your voice, you achieved with your deeds. You didn't have to say a word for the last 40, 50 years of your life. And you didn't just shake up the world, you lit it up because of the way that you lived. You know, a lot of times you think about the test of Muhammad Ali standing in front of the courts, Standing in front, Muhammad Ali taking on the government of the United States of America. Taking on his own government in a country where people were lynched. In a country where people like him would be killed senselessly for not even, not, for, for not opening their mouths, for nothing. And he dared to take on the government of the United States. By the way, Muhammad Ali never had a bodyguard either. <laughs> The day that Malcolm was assassinated, his apartment, he came, home to his, he came to his own home and found that it was set on fire. And it was, sent, it was meant to send a message to him that don't even think about it. Don't try. Before Ali stood in front of the United States government to protest the Vietnam War, there was a man that was already willing to give up any opportunity for his principles. His principles were still in formation, but that courage and that integrity had already been well planted. As a young man, Allah filled him with it. And I want you to think about 22-year-old Muhammad Ali, 22-year-old Cassius Clay, who's getting ready for the biggest fight of his life, for a shot at the world championship, a chance to be globally known and celebrated, to take out the champ, fully confident in his ability to knock out Sonny Liston. And then Malcolm X shows up in Miami, Florida, one of the most controversial men in America. White America hated him. Black America was confused by him. <laughs> Malcolm is not someone you want around for a high-profile event. And Malcolm is walking around, calling him his little brother, carrying a camera, taking pictures of him in some of the most tense times of his relationship with the Nation of Islam. And the promoters walk up to Cassius Clay at 22 years old, who has the opportunity to be the world champion and have all the money presented to him, and say to him, it's either us or Malcolm. Either Malcolm goes or we go. Without thinking, this 22-year-old Cassius Clay, who had spent this entire time building up to the fight, says, fine, call the fight off. Gets in a car with Malcolm, starts to drive up, has these men in suits chasing after him and begging him to stay. 
Cassius says, not only does Malcolm stay, I'm going to put him front row during the fight so that everyone can see him. And after the fight, have Malcolm next to him during the interviews. And then says that, by the way, my name is now Cassius X. There was something about conquering that desire that started very early on. A 22-year-old had already conquered fame and conquered money for his principles and integrity. That was one battle that had already been won. And I actually want you to watch what Malcolm said about Ali after this fight with Sonny Liston. Uh, uh, the, the power structure had successfully created uh, the image of the American Negro as someone with no confidence, no militancy, and uh, they had done this by giving him images of heroes that weren't truly militant or confident. And now here come Cassius, uh, the exact contrast of everything that uh, was representative of the Negro image. He said he was the greatest. Uh, all of the odds were against him. He upset the odds makers. He won. He became victorious. He became the champ. They knew that as soon as uh, if people began to identify with Cassius, and the type of image he was creating, they were going to have trouble out of these Negroes because they'd have Negroes walking around the street saying, I'm the greatest. Cassius decided, and if you could put that picture up, that he was going to be Gharib. Now, if you translate the word Gharib from the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, then it's translated as stranger. I'm going to offer a new definition, non-conformist. He refused to be molded in the image that the oppressor wanted him to be molded in. He refused to be the decorated black athlete, even if that meant more opportunities, more magazine covers, more... Even though he beat Sonny Liston, he still could have had the chance to be another Joe Lewis, to be another Jackie Robinson, to be, another, to be an, an African-American that proudly does what great African-American athletes do. He could have been on the cover of all the magazines, could have been celebrated on the news stations as this 22-year-old young black American that is proving that America doesn't oppress young black people. It gives him a chance to win a world title. He refused. He was nonconformist with himself. He was willing to walk away from the money, willing to walk away from the fame as a 22-year-old, and so now, when he gets faced with this choice that he has to make, which is not just to walk away from the money and the fame, but to give away a title that you already have. To, now, think about that for a moment. You know, it's one thing when you taste it. And one thing when you dream about it. Muhammad Ali, at this point, was the world champ. He was the most famous American in the world. He had completed a global tour where world populations, Muslim populations in the Middle East, African countries, Muslim and otherwise, people came out and celebrated him. He became the greatest in the world, and now he's faced with an opportunity, or he's faced with a challenge, to once again forsake his principles. He never flinches. One thing that always amazed me about him is that he doesn't stutter and his messaging never changes. At no point, even in his lowest points, does his messaging start to become ambiguous. Does he offer any sort of compromise? But you know what, maybe I'll, you know, I'll think about going there and I'll be a chef, but I'm not going to kill anybody. You know, maybe, maybe I can serve in the military uh, over here, but no, I'm, never does his messaging demonstrate any inkling of compromise. Because he chose to be non-conformist. And this drove America crazy because, as he said, I am America. I am the part you won't recognize, but get used to me. Black, confident, cocky, my name, not yours, my religion, not yours, my goals, my own, get used to me. This was a man that was non-conformist, that refused to be threatened by the power of popularity, the power of money, or the power of government who showed that principle. And let me not be ambiguous here for a moment. If you bring Muhammad Ali into your conferences and on your posters and celebrate him, but demonstrate absolutely no integrity 
in the public space as a Muslim organization or as an individual, then you are betraying the name of the person that you are mentioning. It is not okay to use his name to only celebrate certain aspects of him. If you're going to celebrate Ali, you need to be a non-conformist, a gharib, not swayed by any of those things. There's a beautiful saying from Ata, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that to be tested with blessing is so much harder than being tested with poverty and hardship. And he said, why is that? He said, because when you're being tested with poverty and hardship, you recognize it. But sometimes you get drunk in your riches and in your success and in your convenience. And you might foolishly tell yourself that this is all because God has preferred me to other people and this is a sign of God's love and that's why I'm in this place and they're in that place and so I can enjoy my riches and not care about those other people that clearly if God favored, he would get them out of their trouble too. Ali risks prison, becomes so broke that he couldn't pay the gas in his car, fill the gas in his car, except by the speaking engagements that he was getting at universities around the country. That was the only way he could pay the light bill, the world champion, as he faced what was a looming prison sentence. That's Ali. Now at some point he emerges, not just from a warrior for justice, but just as you can't have a cognitive dissonance in regards to which people you choose to champion, a true sense of ihsan, of excellence embodied in the pursuit of justice and peace are in harmony when they are prophetic. They are not in conflict with one another. You see, sometimes, and, and, and you know, Michael and myself, by the way, talk about this all the time, that sometimes, in fact, I remember having this conversation, sometimes we see activists that have no end game. We're going to clamor, look for the next protest, protest again and again and again and again. And our, li our lives will be spent in protest, but we're not really interested in actually seeing anything come out of this. It's just, let's just keep on going at it. Because it makes for a really good Facebook picture. Great cover photo. Just keep it, keep it going. But the actual pursuit of something special, the spiritual tank that you fill in private, and that sense of humanitarianism that develops out of that. The prophet, peace be upon him, he said that, even a smile in the face of your brother is charity. That every single person that you interact with is a testimony for you or against you on the day of judgment. When I went to Louisville, Kentucky for the funeral of Muhammad Ali, I will never forget that every single person that we interacted with, from the shuttle bus driver to the guy at the gas station to the hotel clerk, had a story about meeting Muhammad Ali in Louisville, Kentucky. And every single one of them started to cry when they started to recount what was a simple interaction with him. He never turned down an autograph, never turned down a picture request. He always took the time to actually talk to people. He frequently slipped charity to people. He would show up at your elementary school, show up at your camp, constantly have that interaction. And I want you to watch this video. New York's most famous boxing gym also doubles as a shrine to Muhammad Ali. He trained at Gleason's in the 1960s, where his supersized charisma made him an electrifying presence. But it's not just as a megastar that they remember him here, it's also as a friend. I mean, he would do anything that he would do anything for. He'd help you as much as he can. Uh, he'd take, give you the shirt off his back. He just was that nice of a guy. He's just a nice person, period. And he'd stop and talk to anybody. He'll stop. He, he'll not only stop and talk to the guy with the standing in the corner with the suit and tie on, he'll talk to the bum that's laying on the ground, half drunk or half dead. He'll stop and talk. You know what? If you start talking to him, he'll talk to you. One thing about Muhammad Ali, he loved to talk. His star power could fill arenas the size of Madison Square Garden a hundred times over. But it was the intimacy that photographer Michael Gaffney recalls. He spent a year on the road with Ali in the late 1970s and has special memories of a trip to South America, where Ali toured hospitals filled with polio victims and lent a helping hand to the poor. Every day, 
that we were there, there were beggars lined up in the hallway. And he would... He gave each one of them a $100 bill. And I said, champ, why, why are you doing that? And he said, because $100 here is worth $10,000 at home. And that was him. The Prophet وسلم, said, La tahqiranna min al-ma'roofi shay'a. Do not belittle a single good deed. Sometimes in the process of thinking about saving the world, you forget to save the person that's right in front of you. Sometimes in the process of talking about correcting all of the horrific systemic injustices that exist at the government level, you forget to serve as a manifestation of justice in the face of cruelty when it's right in front of you as you walk past the homeless person in the street. Sometimes we forget that it's those small deeds that Sheikh Ala was talking about that might be the cause for us getting into paradise. Muhammad Ali valued that small deed. By the way, I have gone to masjid after masjid, mosque after mosque in the country, and heard stories about his million dollar checks to the mosque that nobody knew about. I've seen the place, some of you might remember the image that scene in the movie in Miami where him running around getting pulled over by the cops. He built a six million dollar masjid there called Masjid al-Ansar, the Masjid of the Helpers, mandated that there would be two feedings a week to the neighborhood. It's a rundown neighborhood in Miami with one of the most beautiful mosques in America just sitting right there. Masjid Fatr in Chicago. A masjid in Ecuador. <laughs> there are mosques around the country that he would put his money into, charities that he would build, funded an entire Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon in 1976 paid for the entirety of that camp, was asked why he doesn't showcase that charity. There was a journalist in South Africa that said that he wrote an editorial about how Ali was donating the purse of his last eight fights, his entire earnings from his, his last eight fights in charity, and he donated all of it. And he started to write a story, and he said he got a call from Ali himself, angry, asking him not to write it. Because he said, I showcase my fights I'm not trying to showcase my charity to anyone except for God. Ali also, one of the things that made him unique and distinguished was not just the smallness of the good deeds that he was willing to do while he was doing those major deeds that were making him the most famous man in the world. It was the fact that he refused to see people as small, cast aside, worthless, not worth the investment of our emotions, not worth the investment of our aid. Why? Because they're drugged up. They're prisoners. You know, I often tell people, subhanAllah, with Malcolm X, the man who is responsible for Islam in America in so many different ways, including Muhammad Ali, who said that if it wasn't for Malcolm, my tombstone would have simply read Cassius Clay, the greatest boxer of all time. And if you saw Malcolm... In 1952, you might have turned away from him as well. Because you might have thought he wasn't worth your time because he was just a crook, a criminal. Not thinking about what led him to those circumstances or the potential that he had. Ali embodied what Allah tells us in the Quran, which is not just to spend on the poor, but Allah warns us in a very physical way of not turning away from the poor. One of the worst things that happens to us is this great sense of apathy. You start to accept that this is the way that the world is supposed to be. And so just as you familiarize yourself with watching TV and seeing people starve and seeing people in detrimental situations, you're able to walk to your five-star restaurant, step over homeless people, and not ask yourself, what is the systemic poverty that has led them to that situation? And do I have any responsibility to those people? I'm not just talking about pulling a dollar out of your pocket and giving it to them. I'm talking about taking the time to think, you know what? Not only is a deed never too small, but a person is never too small.
Former heavyweight champions slip out of the news as easily as ex-presidents. But Muhammad Ali was never your garden variety champion of all the world. Yesterday in Los Angeles, he responded like a superhero when a distraught man threatened suicide. Terry Drinkwater reports. From a ledge nine floors above Wilshire Boulevard, the hooded man shouted, I'm no good. I'm going to jump. The Viet Cong are coming at me. Police, a psychologist, and a minister had all but given up trying to change the despondent man's mind when Muhammad Ali, who happened to be nearby, volunteered to talk to him. The former heavyweight champion went to a window and reportedly yelled, I'm your brother. I want to help you. Recognizing Ali, the man finally opened the fire escape door and Ali approached him on the ledge. It was a very tense 20 minutes. Several times it looked as though Ali was going to fail. Then, suddenly it was all over. The man, Ali said later, began to weep. He was taken to the psychiatric ward of a veteran's hospital. The former champ promised to visit him there later this week. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Los Angeles. Not being distracted by your power, not being distracted by your celebrity, not being distracted by your wealth, not being distracted by the restaurant you're going to, not being distracted by your comfort, not being distracted by your food, not being distracted by your phone call, never thinking that a situation like that is not worth your time. You know the most amazing thing about these stories is that you never really hear about what happened to the guy that received that $100 bill as he was a beggar. You don't know that perhaps that was a turning point in that person's life and they grew up to be just as charitable as the one who showed generosity to them. You know what's amazing about that man who Ali saved from committing suicide, yelling out that I am your brother, is that you don't actually know what happened to that man afterwards, whether or not he cleaned up his life and became a source of comfort to someone else. Because you don't know who you're helping that might be helping someone else. The prophet, peace be upon him, said that there was a man that went out one night to give charity. And he said, I'm going to give charity in secret so that no one, no one knows. It's just between me and Allah. So at night, he goes out and he hands off some charity to somebody. And the next morning, he wakes up and people say, did you hear what happened last night? And he, and, and he hears them talking. And they say, someone gave charity to a prostitute. <laughs> and the man said, Allahumma lak alhamd. Oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. I thought I was doing the right thing. Somehow I ended up doing that instead. So he said, let me try it again tonight. So he goes out the next night and he does it again. And he wakes up in the morning and the people say, did you hear what happened? And he says, what? Somebody gave charity to a thief last night. And he said, Allahumma lak alhamd. Oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. I don't know what to make of this, but I'm going to keep on trying. So he does it a third night, and he wakes up in the morning. And people say, do you know what happened? And he says, what? They say, someone gave charity to a rich man last night. And he said, Allahumma lak alhamd, oh Allah, to you belongs all praise. I don't know what to do with myself anymore. And then an angel informed him what? That that woman that was earning in a prohibited fashion earned that mo saw that money and she said, Allah still cares about me. Allah is still sending me something. God is still sustaining me, so how can I do something that is displeasing to him trying to sustain myself? The thief decided as he received that charity that God was sending him a message that he didn't have to steal from anyone because God would provide for him. The wealthy man felt ashamed of himself when he received that charity and thought, I too should be giving charity as well. And so sometimes it's not even about the quality of the person. It's not even the animal that could get you into paradise or hellfire. It's the fact that you don't realize the extent of your charity and how far it will go. Another thing that Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, said is that every single person that you come across in this life will find you on the day of judgment and will be a character witness for you or against you. The more that you interact with a person, the more you can expect to see of them on the day of judgment. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was sitting with his companions one day as a funeral passed by and the people started to speak well and remember and recount the charity and the generosity and the good character. And the Prophet وسلم, said, Wajabat, wajabat, wajabat. It has become mandatory. Another person came by and 
as the funeral passed by, they started to remember the abuse of that person. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Wajabat, Wajabat, Wajabat. It has become mandatory. It has become mandatory. It has become mandatory. They said to the Prophet, O Prophet of God, how can you say it has become mandatory to both of these people? What are you talking about? He said, ask for the first one to whom you testified of his good character. Paradise has become mandatory for that person by virtue of your testimony. And the Prophet taught us, Al-Aqrabuna, Awla bil ma'roof. Those that are closest to you are most deserving of seeing your good character. So you can be wonderful on the outside, but be a jerk on the inside of your home. That character witness is going to weigh heavier on the Day of Judgment, the one of people who encounter you more frequently. But consistency here, that the people will testify for or against you on the Day of Judgment. And I want you to watch this next video. lady one time there was a little boy there he looked frail and he wanted to meet Muhammad Ali I said no problem and I brought the boy in and his dad Muhammad looked at the boy and he said why do you have this hot wool hat on he said it's so hot out there today he said I got leukemia and I lost all my hair I'm getting this chemo and Ali said I'll tell you what I'm gonna beat George Foreman and you're gonna beat leukemia the boy looked at him, he said, oh, I hope you're right, Ali, I hope you're right. I went and I got my camera, and I took a picture of the little boy and Ali, and I got the father's address. I had Ali right on the picture. I'm going to beat George Foreman, and you're going to beat cancer. God bless you, Muhammad Ali. So about two weeks later, I get a call. It said, the boy's father, he said, Jimmy's very sick. He's in the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. He's not going to make it. But the thrill of his life was meeting Muhammad Ali. I said, geez, I'm sorry to hear it. Is there anything we can do? No. So that next morning, we're doing road work. 4.30 in the morning before the sun is up when he can run. And I tell him about the boy. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. When I get done my exercise and all, we take a shower, we head down to the hospital. So we go down to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital, two-hour ride, we went in. Here's a little boy with a white sheet, a white kid, no hair, big blue eyes. And he said, Muhammad, I knew you would come. And Muhammad reached and he held the little boy. He said, remember, I told you that you are going to beat cancer and I'm going to beat George Foreman and that's the way it's going to be. And the little boy said, no, Muhammad, I'm going to meet God and I'm gonna tell them that I know you. There wasn't a word said in the two hour ride going back. About a week later, the little boy died. The father called me and Ali said he didn't want to go to the funeral. It was too sad. So I went over to the funeral and in the casket, they had the boy laid out, and they had the picture there. I'm going to beat George Foreman, you're going to beat cancer. The boy was going to go to heaven and say he was a friend of Muhammad Ali's to get a better seat or a better place. That's, that's a great compliment, isn't it? Abdullah bin Omar, may Allah be pleased with them, said that if I knew that God had accepted from me one act of charity, one act of prayer, one prostration, then I would wish for death. I would be ready to meet him. These are the stories that make up a person. To have a boy dying of cancer say, I'm going to go meet God and tell him that I know you and hope that that's my ticket into heaven is more, of, more to his scale than the boy who was testifying. How many people have you made that effort to touch a sick person, someone that was struggling in your community that you found of? And Allah says on the Day of Judgment, I was sick and you did not visit me. And a person says, oh my Lord, how could I visit you? And you are the Lord of worlds. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, says that he would respond and say, don't you know that so-and-so was sick? And had you visited that person? you would have found 
me with him? A lot of times we miss out on these opportunities. And so there's, there, those are those small deeds, those things that all of you have access to, that all of us have access to, to work that act of kindness and maybe just maybe have that one person show up on the day of judgment and say, oh Allah, I remember her. I remember him. When I was going through my hard time, he was there for me. She was there for me. I remember that smile. I remember that act of kindness. I remember that visit to the hospital because on the day of judgment, nothing is forgotten. And then to recognize that there are things that only you are positioned to do and to act in accordance with that. God has given every single one of us a unique platform. It's pretty safe to say that none of us are Muhammad Ali, that none of us have that platform. But God has given each and every single one of us, Allah has given all of us a path and a platform. And there will come times where you can't really embellish it any further, but your spiritual compass doesn't allow you to turn away from it. It's not about the platform anymore. Ali could have not done a single act of charity after 1985 and still gone down as one of the greatest humanitarians in American history and put his book to sleep and you know, not have to worry about it ever again. But instead, he kept on pushing himself. In the first Gulf War, some might remember when he went to free American hostages before the Gulf War even started. And he almost died because at that point his disease had advanced and he almost lost his life because of the inaccessibility of medicine. And I want you to pay attention to what he tells the hostages that literally come up to him and say, you saved our lives. Can you play the video, please? ...would take a beating. Ali had to persuade a man who has openly defined the UN and President Bush to release hostages to him. He'd also have to listen, diplomatically, as Saddam praised himself for his treatment of the hostages. Some of them wanted a certain list of uh, video films, and we succeeded in providing all those films. Not all Iraqi homes have video recorders. Isn't this hospitality? Ali assured Hussein he'd bring back to the U.S. an honest account of his visit to Iraq. I'm not going to let Hajj Muhammad Ali go back to the United States without having a number of the American citizens here accompanying him. After Saddam agreed to release 15 human shields, Ali and his staff prepared to take them out of Iraq as soon as possible. It'd be nice to have the uh, detainees come over this evening. Our guy. You know, I thanked him and he said, go home, be with my family. You know, I spoke to him very briefly, but what a great guy. Champ, all I can say is that there is no way in the world that I can adequately thank you. Um, I thank God. Yeah. God works through people. It's not me. Well, I know, I know, but it's, you, you literally saved my life. One of the things that is amazing about Ali's quotes is that he was very intentional and it seemed to be two people that were living in contradiction of one another. How could the man that stood up and said, I'm the greatest, I'm pretty, I'm beautiful, I'm the king, be so humble and not be willing to accept one moment of praise when it came to the good deeds that he did. The man who said service is the rent that you pay for your room here on earth. Because when Ali used to shout, I'm the greatest, I'm beautiful, he said he wasn't doing that for himself. He said he was doing that for young black children in America that had been told that they were lowly, that they weren't beautiful. He wanted young black children around America to walk around and say, I'm the greatest, I'm beautiful, and see that example. It wasn't for himself. And so glory and humility were both meant to be for something other than him. I know I'm getting late, but 
Muhammad Ali said, truly great people in history never wanted to be great for themselves. All they wanted was the chance to be great for God. He never wanted to be great for himself. He wanted to be great for God. He didn't seek that praise, and only Allah knows how many more secret deeds of charity never made the press, never made the papers, never made a video, never made the story, but would stand on the Day of Judgment and testify alongside that young boy that died of cancer and say, I met Muhammad Ali, and he brought me comfort and brought me ease. It was never for him, and that's why he did not accept for him a sense of praise, but instead wanted to praise him. And there's that last interview that uh, I always look at, and it's just so beautiful because you see his face light up when he answers this question. Who are you most grateful to for your career? What's real success, all my protection, all my fitness, all my victory, all my courage, everything comes from Allah. You can see him light up when he says it. And you know it comes from the heart. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that when you pass away, you will be asked about four things. You will be asked about your life and how you lived it. You will be asked about your body and how you consumed it. An jismihi fima abla. You will be asked about your knowledge and how you served with it. And you will be asked about your wealth, how you earned it, and how you spent it. Those are the four questions that you would be asked. Muhammad Ali was asked, he said, you know, champ, you don't live in the mansions that most retired boxers do. You don't seem to be hoarding enough of this for you. And he responded, he said, wealth isn't that which you possess. It's that which you spend. He found wealth in being that person of service and constantly saw that for God. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that whoever lowers himself for God, man tawadu alillah, rafa'ahullah, whoever lowers himself to God, Allah elevates him in honor. That the more you humble yourself, the greater you become in the sight of God. For a person like this to normalize this, and at the same time, this, when they come up to him and say that we want to put your name on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and he says, nope, no one's stepping on the name Muhammad. It's not going to happen. And so they say to him, but there's no way the most famous American of the 20th century is not going to have his name on the Walk of Fame. He says, I'm not going to allow for the name Muhammad Ali to be stepped on because it's the name of my prophet. They told him, okay, we'll make an exception for you. He's still fighting with Parkinson's and can barely talk, can barely move, but he's still a man of principle. They say, we'll make an exception and we'll put your star up on the wall. And he said, okay. And so if you go to the Hollywood Walk of Fame, side note, where Donald Trump's star was recently uh, vandalized, I had nothing to do with it, <laughs> but I am mad about it. If you go to the Walk of Fame, you see that one star that distinguishes itself above all others, and it is Muhammad Ali. I want to end with this uh, quote, and I know that I've gone too long. Maybe I shouldn't have put too many slides together. Heroes are not meant for us to gaze at like inaccessible stars that leave behind no actionable items of good deeds sometimes even excusing our own inability to do good because I can't be Muhammad Ali. I can't be Malcolm. I can't be Martin. I can't be the prophet, peace be upon him. I can't be Jesus. I can't be Moses. I can't be Abraham. I can't be Khadija. I can't be Fatima. I can't be Maryam. I can't be these people. 
These are people that are meant to be in the documentaries. These are the people that are meant to be celebrated. These are the people that history elevates. Sometimes we justify our own laziness, our own idleness, our own apathy by making our heroes inaccessible. Worse is when we make them tools for our deviation and appropriate and sanitize and compromise to where we even use their examples and chart them into a course of evil and a course of deviation and greed and say, well, they weren't perfect. You know, they were not perfect. And you could say they weren't perfect and mean two things by it. You could say they weren't perfect to say, well, let me strive and do good because they did amazing things despite not being perfect. Or you could say, well, they weren't perfect, so don't expect me to try to be any better. Let me live at peace with my imperfections. And so I'll give you one more quote from Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali said, one person with knowledge of this life's purpose is more powerful than 10,000 people operating without that knowledge. One person understanding their purpose in life and working in accordance with it is more useful and beneficial than 10,000 people that don't know their purpose. There have been celebrities and athletes and people with platforms that rivaled Muhammad Ali's that are already forgotten and that did nothing with their platforms except fulfill themselves. And there are people that don't have platforms. People that don't have a lot of money to give, but they have a smile. People that don't have fame and mean a lot to a bunch of pe observers in a superficial way, but they mean something to somebody in their community or their family. People that have special qualities and talents and abilities and that use all of them, not for the sake of themselves, but for the glory of Allah. That's how you elevate yourself to a Muhammad Ali. And as we celebrate this man and as we ask Allah to accept from him and, and have mercy on him for all the good that he did, for all that he left behind of an example, if you're not making the connection between yourself and the guy who would not turn away a beggar, who didn't find that man that was trying to jump off a roof that was probably on drugs not worth his time, who didn't turn away a single interaction, who secretly spent his charity, who advocated for the people that were in his land and of his, of his color and people who he could not communicate with or relate with in Vietnam. If you're not connecting all of that to the cause that brought us here today, you're missing the point. Where would Muhammad Ali be if these issues of contaminated water for indigenous people whose land was stolen from them that we occupy, where would he be on this cause? Where would he be on this issue, dear brothers and sisters? If Muhammad Ali said, service is the rent that you pay for your room here on earth, what about service or what's the rent that you pay for living on occupied land and benefiting from the cleanest and purest of resources? while the people who rightfully own this land cannot even have a clean sip of water. And so I hope, inshallah, that you leave tonight not just fulfilled, not just feeling a greater connection to this great American Muslim, this great American period, this great Muslim period, this great human being period, but that you yourself activate as much as you can that potential through purpose that Allah has put inside of you. Jazakumullah khairan for giving me all of this time. Thank you all very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.